welcome back it's good to see everyone here um, tonight we have a very special guest uh who is not here yet but he assures me he is he is on the way so welcome i just want to let folks know you're you're listening to united public radio the intro music was by mark of the doomslayer by carl casey at whiteback bat audio and today's guest will be leonard lynn buchanan who is now retired from u.s army intelligence he has used remote viewing to assist police and federal agents in locating missing children and founded problem solutions innovations a company that helps corporations develop solutions for intelligence related data acquisition considered to be one of the best remote viewing trainers he lives in alamogordo mexico so uh, as soon as he joins i will uh I'll, I'll bring him on to the the channel but in terms of uh let's see how everybody's doing tonight good evening anthony jones it's always a pleasure to see you my friend hello talk no mo hope i pronounced that properly jml let's go my friend absolutely should be interesting it's, it's already interesting i <laughs> the last week last week uh was supposed to be terry loveless and uh you know i think he had like a scheduling issue so he's going to be next week this week is lynn buchanan as as you all know but i'm uh still waiting for for lynn to join he's he's working on some communications issues so now it's about a, as good a time as any as the what i'm going to cover with lynn on the interview is we're going to go back all the way from the beginning so if folks are familiar with through a glass darkly the youtube channel and you know, for folks who are listening this is through a glass darkly radio with sean patrick hazlett for folks who are familiar a lot of this is going to be what we covered in some of the interviews with lynn on the channel well probably a little bit more all right i he's he's joined us he's joined us i just don't see his face yet so he's got the background going but but while we're while he's getting everything settled um what kind of questions do folks um you know to the extent that i have time working in uh, outside of the regular routine if you have questions um let, let me know okay yeah he's got he's got a lot of those oh he just he just disappeared again so hopefully he's hopefully he's back on um yeah hopefully we get to that um yeah he's feeling fine he's just working out tom's tom stuff um i hope he's not getting nervous because he's he, he took down an entire all the comms infrastructure and all the skiffs across europe um that should be part of his story but and and by the way jml asked for people who are listening let's get to his interactions with nhi let me uh let me see if i can talk to lynn um i don't want to add him to the stage yet but let's see Well, I mean, it is radio, so. Lynn, can you hear me? Let's just bring him to the. Well, we'll just let's see see what happens. See if I'm feeling see if I'm feeling lucky. Lynn, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear now, but I can't oh, see okay, you. Good. I've been having all kinds of trouble. It wouldn't take my camera it wouldn't take my microphone it wouldn't take anything yeah <laughs> are you still Computers. having uh, well i mean you have you have some experience with taking them down <laughs> right? yeah um so are you able to get uh visual at all if not we can we can just fight through it because yes the uh way. the microphone is uh well, my earphones aren't working. Nothing. Okay. I would just try it. This is this is audio only. Right now it is. Uh, but but oh. people can see on video too, though. Uh, 
Okay, try it again. I'm sorry. All right. Um, it's both audio and video. On radio, they'll hear you on radio, but the yeah. um, they can also see on video. Right now, we just see the the mountains. I think behind your house. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, that's that's a painting I did. Uh, no, that's right. That's right. Yes, we they can see yeah. the painting and they can see your name. Stop cam. How do I select a cam? You got it to change very, very briefly to whatever you just did, but it wasn't showing you. It was just showing the... Uh... Yeah. The camera is turned on and working. <laughs> uh, oh, press control plus E. No. How do I set it up for the camera? I see one for the microphone settings. Uh, virtual see. background camera. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah, you're in the um, settings. So let's see. Let's see. yeah. So yeah, just go to camera, and then okay. there'll be there'll be a list of selections. Okay, right? but there are no, oh, okay. Try this one. Here, let me. And that one didn't work. Uh, it's got another one. The device is not connected. <laughs> All right, let's look at the other questions and work this out. Look, 90% of the battle is, is the guest shows up. So, all right, so some of the questions. Has he piloted a craft? I can answer that, yes. Uh, or he claims. Um, how is the remote viewing ranch coming along? Okay, yeah, we can get into that. Sky pilots, yeah, yeah. Um, how about viewing the election and then the future in intervals of 50 years? Yeah, the, first, the next 20 years, like the current 20 years that we're in are a little rough. Um, we'll try to get through everything before we get to that. I don't think he likes to talk about that as much anymore. Um, during the largest company's corporate call, same thing happens during the largest. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, 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 I'm fine. I'm just bobbing and weaving. Like I said, the toughest part is making sure that, um, so if Lynn can hear me, you know, your, your device is not connected for, for whatever reason. Um, All right. What other questions do people have that want, want uh, me to take a take a shot at? There we go. Let's go. Brandon says, "What do you think of the idea that forecasting the future helps to manifest the outcome?" He's he's got a good example of that actually, because sometimes it can change the outcome. Um, but it just depends on how certain the potential is. If it's a rock or if it's a you know, if it's a, a fly, kind of is the is the answer. Hey, how you doing, Mark? <laughs> Trying to get uh, Lynn on. He's he's on, but he's he's having some technical difficulties. So we're just going through various questions that that people might have. Um, let's see. I'm just gonna send him an email. All right, sorry, folks. Um, you know, multi. This is this is, this is multitasking in real time. This is uh, this is, this is very professional here. We're very professional. Okay, so Mark Rennie is saying is remote viewing based on the fact that everything is connected. Yeah, that's 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 a great that's a great question for David Morehouse. He's going to tell you about the eight dimensional holographic field and all that. Okay, I think Lynn's back. 
All right, Lynn. Can you hear me now? Oh, I can hear you. You are just fine. Oh, I can also hear myself. Stream this to your audience. No, you don't worry about that unless you want okay, it to yeah. go to your, your own okay. YouTube channel. Um, All right, we got some progress. We got an icon now. We have an icon at least. Yeah, settings, camera. Where's your camera? Camera. Oh, I just saw. Do you have a green screen behind you? I have a green screen behind me. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm. Yeah. Ah. Wait. It works. <laughs> that was the of most course. excitement of my night. Uh -huh. All right. It's amazing. It's good to see you again, my friend. Oh, good seeing you. Let's see if I can get this thing to focus now. The thing is, I was just on a Zoom call and it was working fine. Well, you're you're switching from Zoom to Streamyard, so it's going to be kind of it's going to be kind of weird. Right? I see. Okay. Yeah. So, all right, we'll we'll get into we'll get into everything kind of quickly, and then <laughs> a lot a lot of, a lot of my a lot of my uh, viewers watch the YouTube channel, so they 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 will have heard a lot of this stuff but we're going to go through from the very beginning yeah. fortunately i know the i kind of know the story at least i think i do but i obviously don't know the full story but we'll start all the way back when you were a kid when you started to see i don't know if you interpreted it as poltergeist activity even though we kind of you have a sense oh, of what had, it really was i had yeah. no idea what poltergeist activity was i'd never heard of it All right. Well, when you were kind of younger, when did you start? Like, when did the strange things start? Happening? I guess like, when it, I was different. about 12, somewhere around there. And then can you explain some of the, the kind of incidents that happened? I just started uh, kind of knowing when the phone was going to ring. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd start answering questions before they were asked. Things like that. Um, How did just, people react to that? Can you give an example of that? Where, like, uh, that not too or... well. <laughs> 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 My father, especially, uh, he uh, he thought, you know, oh great, I've got a, I've got a freaky son. <laughs> My mother, uh, my mother was uh, just accepted accepting of it uh totally all right so any, any other incidents from childhood that were kind of noteworthy oh uh, yeah um at one point um uh, i uh well i remember the day uh I was out with a bunch of other kids and we were throwing rocks at this big iron plate. And uh, I'm a huge iron plate leaning up against a wall. And uh, I threw a rock and I heard sort of a voice in my head that said, go through. Mm -hmm. And the rock went through the iron plate, hit mm -hmm. the wall behind it and landed on the ground and all of us were watching this and we ran up and look and there was the rock behind the plate and uh, i thought that's neat and so uh, was there I started, any damage to the plate at all no there wasn't a hole there wasn't anything it just went through and so uh, i started playing with it and got to where I could do it uh, on command. And um, my life kind of parallels Charlie Brown's, you know. <laughs> uh, I was trying to impress the cute little redheaded girl one day and I told her and she was impressed 
And she went home and told her father, the uh, Pentecostal minister. Oops. And the next day, he and three of his deacons met me on the way home from school. And he said, could you show me that? And when I showed him that, he they slammed me down onto the sidewalk had my head pressed against the sidewalk, screaming for the devil to come out of me. And uh, uh, just, you know, the way I was raised, if the preacher said it, then God right. said it. And right. so, you trust institutions back then. I mean, oh, yeah. You know. And uh, I never thought there might be something evil to this. I thought it was neat. And so um, I started trying to suppress it. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't suppress um, and has recurred all through my life. Uh, when I was um, in Augsburg, Germany, years, yeah, so let's, let's years get later, yeah. yeah, let's get to the point where you you enlist in the army. Yeah, I, I think you did a period of time, and then left the army. You know, kind of became yeah, a minister. Yeah, I did a period of time back. as yeah. a missile man. Mm -hmm. I left the army for about about twelve years, and uh, went back in. Uh, I went in to become a chaplain. Uh, they gave me these tests, and uh, I could speak five languages. Uh, Wait, did they make you the take IQ. the uh, the DLAT test, the Defense Language Aptitude Test? Would they oh, give yeah. you a briefing? Did oh, they give yeah. you the same briefing they gave me, where they said, like, if you reveal the contents of these, this test, you get oh, sure. 20 years of hard labor? Yeah, they yeah. read you on, yeah. 10 years yeah. and, and $10,000 fine, yeah. Yeah, and, and it said uh, hard labor. I, like they explicitly said, ten years yeah. hard labor. Well, but. I maxed the DLib test and uh, finished it about ten minutes early, and they said they had never seen that before. So anyway, they pushed me into um, intelligence service, and that's where I stayed the rest of my time. Um, okay. Yeah. Fast forward to Augsburg, where you were going. That's what right. happens in Augsburg. O o o oh, yeah. Augsburg, That's why I wound up in Augsburg. Yeah. I don't know what this computer is doing over here. Uh, okay. Um, and so there in Augsburg, I had been commissioned to write a massive program that would tie the computers of 12 different countries together mm -hmm. uh, and get them talking to each other. And um, took me about six months. And when I uh, was showing it, we had the uh, commanding generals of 12 different countries. Mm -hmm. And I had I had gotten the commission over this other sergeant who wanted to write the program. And when I was demonstrating it, uh, he had gimmicked up the program without me knowing it. And I gave my little song and dance. And, uh, and by the way, who was in the audience? This is really important. Who was in the audience? Who oh, the, to? the commanding generals. And also, uh, this uh, captain had stepped in the room to see a collection of generals and bigger than he had ever seen before. And I didn't know that he had been commissioned by General Stubblebine, head of mm -hmm. the Intelligence and Security Command, to uh, uh, find and identify people who had psychic ability. And so anyway, he had trained, trained them to uh, see it. 
And uh, so anyway, I pressed the enter key to show the, you know, show the program. And the computer went dead. Not only did it go dead, well, um, it went dead. Everybody started laughing at me. And I turned around and looked. And this other sergeant was at the back door of the room and said, gotcha. And turned around and walked out. I got flaming mad. And when I did, the entire field station went down. Um, I didn't know it at the time until years later that uh, intelligence computers basically throughout Europe and, and all that had also gone down. But um, I knew what happened. And I thought, man, I will be paying for a computer. My grandkids will be paying for computers and all that. So I didn't say anything about it. But this captain reported me to the general. And when you say when you say intelligence computers, you mean like all the computers in the skiffs across Europe? The secret compartmented in, or in our in our skiff was the only one I knew it about the time. Mm -hmm. uh, what about but, the Soviets? Uh, what about the like on the other side of the? Because this is during this is in the eighties. Just to um, be clear, right? yeah, during the eighties. Or... During the eighties, yeah, no. Um, and so anyway, um, about two months later, General Stubblebine came in to. Uh, install a new commander at the field station at the skiff and uh, I was told the general wants to see you go get into your class A uniform so I went home got in that class A uniform and came back and was in the new commander's office and uh General Stubblebine had the ceremony to install the new commander. They came back in, and General Stubblebine, of course, was first, and the new commander was following him. He came up to me, looked at my uniform, and said, are you General Buchanan? I mean, uh, Sergeant Buchanan. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, sir. He took me by the arm and pushed me in front of him to go into the new commander's office, turned around to the new commander and said, I need to talk to Sergeant Buchanan, get out. Guess what list I went to the top of for the rest of the time I was yeah, there. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it's a list that rhymes with hit. It does, yes. Yep. Uh, and, but anyway, um, he stood me at attention and he said, did you kill my computers with your mind? And I was going to lie about it. And I mean, how I did just, you even interpret that? Did you think he was? I mean, I had somebody no asked idea. you that, you think they would like? Is this guy serious? Yeah, because I didn't know about this captain. Yeah, I didn't find out about that until months later, and uh, so I just heard myself say, "Yes, sir, I did," and he said. This grin came over his face, and he said, "Far f and out have I ever got a job for you?" <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, a few months later, he took me to D.C. He wanted me to be the start of a uh, unit that he had planned to destroy enemy computers mm -hmm. and uh, with the end 
uh, goal of learning how to control the data in a computer, in an enemy computer, so that we could mess up their programming, make their missiles turn around and go back, or drop into the sea, things like that. And uh, he went to Congress to get funding for that project. And they said, that sounds like mind control. Hell no. <laughs> so he took me out to Fort Meade, Maryland, mm -hmm. put me in the remote viewing unit, which I'd never heard of. And when they read me on, I was reading the read on processes. And I thought, this is crazy. The army doesn't do this. And I thought, I'm on candy camera. Come on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, come to find out, he put me in the unit. And over the next few weeks, I watched the guys doing it. And it was amazing. Um, and so they started teaching me. And um, within a couple of years, um, the person who had been training uh, shipped out. And I became the trainer of the unit for the first time, for the last, uh, for the rest of the time I was there. So what years were you there from? Like what, what year did you join the unit and then what year did you join? Uh, 83 to, I was there for eight and a half years. So 83 to 90, 91, 92, 91, 92, 92. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you were there when Abel Archer... Ha were you there when Abel Archer happened, or were you there shortly? Because that was in 83. That after. was when there was almost a new... After. Okay. All right, so you were in Augsburg. That incident probably happened close to when Abel Archer happened, it sounds like. Sa same yeah. year, right? Huh. Anything about that, or is that the class in my part? <laughs> okay, not, I won't push. <laughs> not, not to speak of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so for folks, for folks in the in the audience, just for the historical background of, um, I think it was Abel Archer. That's the right name of the event, right? It's it's public. It's all public. But there was a an, a huge military exercise that was happening with NATO, and the Soviet Union was kind of freaking out because they thought it was the prelude to an actual exercise right because if you look at the recent war in ukraine with putin uh they had a huge military exercise and they usually precede an actual invasion with an exercise as a cover so the russians or the soviets at the time i believe thought thought that huge exercise which was only really it was only an exercise was a yeah. cover for for you know prelude to potential nuclear war so it was really tense all right so you're in europe during that time and uh, you've never set a precise date for when all the skiffs went out. But if I were the other thing you didn't mention is that the Soviets at the time, I think you found out subsequently that their communicate their secret communications network also went out. You found that out after the Cold War. Is that correct? During I found it of time? that out years later. Yeah. OK, so I'm not saying this is the right timeline and you have not said anything, but yeah. there is. Yeah, this is kind of the same time period this happened. If you're on the Soviet side and you see your communications network suddenly shut off, maybe before, after, during a large military exercise, you might actually think you're it's the beginning of an attack. You might think it's an EMP. Uh, from what I learned later, there was panic on both sides. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to push for obvious reasons. Yeah. Okay. So 1983 you head to the United States to Fort Meade, Maryland. When you're told about this program, who introduced it to you? Is it Skip Atwater or was it somebody else? Oh, well, yeah, Skip was the, um, 
operations officer when I came into the unit. Um, when I started, um, he took me over to the building where we did our actual remote viewing work. And um, he sat me down and he said, look around this room. And I said, okay. And it was a room. And he said, I want you to know something. In this room, it's okay to be psychic. And all of a sudden, all of that weight of my head being pressed into the sidewalk and all that, and all that burden of trying to suppress it and all that, it just went away. It was something about the way he said it. And it just went away. And I thought, yeah, this is the job I want. And it was the best job I've ever had in my life. Okay, so you find out about the program, then you have to be trained to do it. Yeah. How did that process work? And this is back before all these protocols were created and all that stuff. This is who trained you and what did that process look like? And I know it's since changed yeah. a lot, but... Up until that time, Ingo Swan had trained everybody in the unit. Now, the week before I got there, this is story of my life, uh, Ingo lost his job with Stanford Research. And so the guys in the unit who had been trained by Ingo started training me. And so... Uh, even though I became really good friends with Ingo later, uh, I got trained by the guys in the unit, mm -hmm. which means they were trained to remote view. And then they went back to the unit and learned how to apply it to actual military operations. When I came in, I learned, first of all, how to apply it to military operations and learn the remote viewing through that. So I had sort of a backward training thing, but uh, but it worked. Yeah. I mean, do you think it matters which direction it goes or is it better to kind of have a generalized? OK, because you would you basically started from the specific and then eventually went to the general, whereas right. everybody yeah. else kind of started before but, you. Uh, yeah. But learning the Ingo Swan process is standard. Uh, you start out by, they call it a series of basic aspects of any site. Mm -hmm. And they'll say the land, gestalt. The gestalt, water, so good, the right? gestalts, yeah. Uh, land, water, space, motion activity, things like that. And you practice doing a absolute minimal uh, line uh, graphic representation of water, mm -hmm. you know, land, uh, of space, and, and things like that. And you do this repeatedly repeatedly. Mm -hmm. By repeatedly, I mean thousands of times. It is so boring. <laughs> and, and it's so boring that um, you get to where they start you out and your conscious mind just phases out. You start thinking about other things. When that happens, your subconscious mind starts learning those ideograms. They're called ideograms. And when it gets to the point where generally without you realizing it, mm -hmm. you will do the ideogram before they call out the word. Uh, that's when they know you're ready. 
to move on into the next stage. And so they move you into the next stage, and then the next stage, and then the next stage, and so on. And um, at that time, the training up through stage six took about six and a half to seven months. And so I was in the boring training for all that time. Uh, but the skills progressed. And now, nowadays, people are learning it in a three or four day course and doing it. Uh, but at the time, it was about a six months course. Yeah. Why does it take much faster now? Is this like a morphic resonance thing? Like a I think so. Morphic resonance. Um, Oh, the hundredth monkey theory, uh, and we've learned a whole lot more uh, about how to train it, also how to use it, and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm glad that the training is faster. <laughs> how, I mean, this is the, this is the, you, you probably have no way of knowing the answer to this, but maybe you do. Globally, do you, how many remote viewers do you think are still out there? Oh, thousands now. Remote. Um, oh, well, thousands of remote viewers. However, once it came out to the internet, everybody started started creating their own way. The difference even is even people who weren't trained as remote. Oh viewers. yeah, who weren't trained. Uh, there are people who immediately started saying, hey, you take this pendulum and you're a remote viewer. And uh, other people said, hey, drink the tea, look at the grounds in the cup, and you're a remote viewer, you know. Yeah, it's like and, Madame Cleo's remote viewing program. Oh, I yeah. Up, but oh, yeah. I didn't make up Madame Cleo, but I made yeah. it up. <laughs> but uh, the Inga Swan process was developed psychologically. And uh, he didn't just make up a routine. It was developed psychologically. It's developed as a martial art. Uh, the principle of it is that, and this is why you start out drawing a line. Mm -hmm. The principle of it is that your subconscious can talk to you through your body. And as you learn the stages, it uh, adds your other senses, smell, sight, hearing, and, and all that, to the physical thing of drawing a line and drawing sketches and all that. And so uh, it gradually teaches you how to use your entire body Mm -hmm. to let your subconscious talk to your conscious mind and to let your conscious mind cue the subconscious. And here's the secret to the Inga Swan process. It is an interview and report process. Your subconscious mind is psychic. Your conscious mind isn't. But if you can teach the two to talk to each other, your conscious mind can cue the subconscious with a question and report the answer. So the CRV process created by Ingo Swan is actually just something that, hey, every radio and TV interviewer should learn. <laughs> Uh, because that's what it does. It teaches you to ask questions that are pertinent mm -hmm. and report purely and accurately what is said. And you know yourself, so many interviewers will hear the answer and turn around and give their interpretation mm -hmm. of what their guest just said. 
wrong mode. Because <laughs> most of the time, that's not what the guest said. <laughs> right, right. It, it's and sometimes the interviewer will lead the guest into a narrative that oh, they yeah. want to portray. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so as you're talking about when you're talking about the subconscious communicating with the conscious, one of the one of the folks listening, um, Mark Rennie, was asking if remote viewing is based on what kind of it, the notion that everything is connected in some way. Oh, it's not based on that, but the fact is that everything is connected. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things you learn in the higher stages is that um, I can give you a target of a flash drive, okay? Mm -hmm. And once you get to where you're accurately describing that flash drive and all, I can say, okay, move to the place where it was manufactured. Now, move to the history of that place. Now, move 8,000 miles to the east and, you know, and at that point, from that flash drive, I can get you anywhere in space and time because it's all connected. It really is. Yeah. So another question related to that. So I think David Morehouse refers to it as kind of the eight dimensional holographic field or something like that, where, yeah. whereas a projection, you know, you, you should be able, if there's a project, like a shadow, you should be able to, that shadow should have all the information in it yeah. that is in the, whatever projected the shadow. So right. in a sense, our dimensional reality is you, is a, is a projection and you can get to a greater dimensional reality by projecting oh, yeah. backward into the, and remote viewing operates off of some aspect of that. I'm not sure you know, exactly how it works. In fact, I don't think many physicists are who, who use this, but um, that, that seems like something that, you know, maybe fits into this connection thing. Yeah. Okay. So you're in this remote viewing unit, you get through the training. And the other thing I want to remind people is you're listening to Through a Glass Darkly Radio with Sean Patrick Hazlett on uh, United Public Radio. And mm -hmm. uh, Lynn Buchanan is my guest. So I had to do that. It's a little, I know it's a little. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you get through training. Okay. What sorts of targets, to the extent that you can discuss them, did they put you on when you were first? There. Well, of course, uh, training targets, uh, mm -hmm. and the training targets were largely just pictures and stories out of National Geographic. But in doing that, they um, taught you the mechanics, the structure, mm -hmm. the processes, and it's no different from any other martial art, you know. They don't mm -hmm. teach you to fight, they teach you to go... Hall, hall, yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so on. And um, then once you learn the tools and how to use them mm -hmm. and you develop the skills, then they start you out with uh, uh, more complex targets. They will start you then with already solved projects and to see if you can get the answer that's right. And once you get to where you can view and get the right answer that they already have feedback, they database your work to get a dependability rating. Mm -hmm. Once you get a dependability rating, you can give them a target and um, I mean, they, they can give you a target and, you know, a target they don't know the answer to, but they will know from the database how dependable you are right. at colors, sounds, smells, taste, textures, temperatures, things like that. 
because all those things are databased. And so uh, they find out your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and then when they move you into operations, task you toward your strengths and continue your training toward your weaknesses. And it's a, it's a very scientific, very logical process. There's no woo-woo about it. There's no woo-woo at all. And this is, is, this, is this something that everybody can do if they're trained properly? I've never found anybody who can't do it. Yeah. I've found a lot of people who won't uh, because it scares them or because of some religious belief, something like that. Uh, but I've never found anybody who can't. Uh, IQ doesn't matter. Background doesn't matter. Uh, gender, race, none of it matters. Now, I'm asking you questions I already know the answers to, but, but you know, just to make it easier for folks. What was your particular skill like what were you the best at in terms of perception and remote viewing uh, several different ones one of the um, more unusual ones was uh, the ability to get into somebody's subconscious mind a target's subconscious mind when it's a person uh, or, or an animal something like that and uh, at that level, you can uh, get them to work out some hidden uh, turmoil that they've had all their life mm -hmm. and get them to heal. Uh, if, if their sickness is caused by some inner turmoil, you can get them to heal, but you get them to heal themselves. All right, I got a really strange question for you. I have to ask this, and I'll tell you where I heard this strange question so I don't sound like a maniac. <laughs> so Grant Cameron once claimed that you were remote viewing Saddam Hussein. And, you know, I can see, everyone can see your eyes for folks who, who are not listening but are watching. Yeah. They can see your eye color is kind of like a slate blue kind of yeah. blue color. I got to ask this. When you were, you know, if you were remote viewing Saddam, because I don't even, I don't know if that's true either. It's an allegation. Mm -hmm. Did your, did your eye color change briefly to brown? Uh, once that I know of, uh, I had a witness. I never felt an eye color change. But mm -hmm. um, uh, once it did, but it was with deep, really deep access. I mean, it doesn't happen on a regular basis, no. Uh, right. But somebody saw your eye color change. Yeah, so I was... Your, your monitor. Uh, Is it with your monitor or was it somebody else? I was the, uh, uh, I was the viewer and the monitor uh, was a new monitor. And uh, saw that, and she jumped up and ran out of the room. I mean, scared her to death. You know, uh, my voice, my voice changed. Uh, and she said my eye color changed. Uh, of course, I didn't know it. So, I only found out the next day. Yeah. When that happened, what were you? Again, I have to be careful because I know some of this stuff might still be classified. So obviously, I was stop. doing a plans and intentions uh, tasking on Saddam Hussein. And did you actually see into his head to some extent? Oh yeah, on uh, plans and intentions. Yeah, you have to get into their mind. But you also have to get into their subconscious mind because their conscious mind may plan something, but their subconscious mind will either cause them to do it or stop them from doing it. 
So you have to really get deeply into their mind. Yeah. Okay. So how how did that feel? I mean, was it dark? Was it was it just a normal person? Like, oh, you get into somebody's mind. It's uh, very logical. Uh, you know, in prison there are no criminals. Uh, in the insane asylum, nobody's crazy. Uh, everybody has a perfectly good reason for everything they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Saddam Hussein, I found, was not what you would call a bad person. Well, according to him. According to him. Well, right, right. even, I wouldn't say he was an evil person. Mm -hmm. He was nuts. He was convinced that God wanted him to rule the world and that God wanted him to do everything necessary in order to achieve that. And so he, he well, he was a sociopath. And so he never had any morals about killing or anything like that. But uh, he didn't do it out of meanness. He did it out of the belief that God wanted him to do it. And he was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of have to be to survive in that sort of environment. Oh, yeah. Right, where everybody's trying to kill you. And uh, yeah, Ch Chester here says that explains a lot. And yeah, it, it, it certainly does. All right, I have a completely off the wall question because somebody asked this earlier, and it's a good question. You got a looks like is that a space force shirt you got on there? Yeah, we now have six branches of the military. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, any, any well, I, I'm going to ask, but you just shut me down immediately. You got a contract with them for remote viewing stuff, or uh, no not so much. Um, I had some uh, of their analysts come by and ask if I would be sort of an on-call uh, uh, consultant. Uh, I said yes, and I haven't been on call yet. So, <laughs> but I got the I got the shirt. <laughs> yeah, been there, got the T-shirt, right? <laughs> yeah. Been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Yeah. All right, let's let's talk about some esoteric targets, right? So there was one that you've talked about in the past where someone gave you a few individuals to observe, and it kind of got you into. You didn't know you didn't know what you were remote viewing at the time because you're not supposed to know what you're remote viewing, but. You saw You've just kind of, narrowed this down to about a hundred different discussions. Go ahead. Yeah, that's that's why I'm trying to. I'm trying. To, <laughs> so, I think there were several targets. I want to say it's on the order of between thirty and a hundred. But it was basically you were looking at an individual before and after death. What did oh, you? Yeah. What did you mm -hmm. see? Like, what are the range of outcomes that you saw? And yeah, you know, talk through the range of outcomes that I saw was that some people uh, went to what I would call heaven. Mm -hmm. Some of them went to what I would call hell. And when I experienced those, I would have nightmares for months afterwards. Uh, it was horrible. I don't, I don't want to go there. Um, another group reincarnated. Mm -hmm. And another group just stopped existing, period. I never saw anybody come back as a ghost. I never did. But I only had 64 people. So, um, and what, was the, what was the distribution and those outcomes of that 64? Was it like 25%? I'm it, not so sure. It, it would be 16, 16, 16, 16. No. But, uh, or was it skewed? I never... I never got the exact um, numerical distribution. Um, but I did take a series, you know, a sampling of them 
and look up the people. And I yeah, found no relationship. Part. Yeah, I found no relationship, whatever, to the report of their life and what I found them as a result of where they went after they died. Of course, you know, you speak nice of the dead no matter what. So who knows? And did you get that in those experiences, this was the result of, because when you looked at their histories, you couldn't really tell if they were good or, or bad. But from the perspective of the person you were viewing, did you get the sense that it was something that was determined for them or that they kind of, you know, if they went to hell, for instance, they kind of were responsible for creating their own all, hell or their own experience. All I got was the result. Yeah, I didn't know. And then what did you see when you saw um, someone reincarnating? What did that look like? What did that proceed? Um, one that I remembered was this um, elderly man who had been a statesman. And afterwards, he became a like a 10 or 12 years old. And he was standing in his front yard and he was wearing a cowboy outfit and his father was taking his picture. And Wait, so he just went immediately from death to an 8, an eight to 12 year old? That's what I got. Yeah. Uh-huh. Hmm. And I don't know, is this why all of the native cultures have a coming of age ceremony when when you're about 12 years old i don't know now what about hell health i'm for it (laughs) (laughs) what did you like what kind of things did you see you know pg PG, obviously, rated. Oh, you mean those targets? Oh, there was a range. There was a range of it. Natural death, uh, car wrecks, uh, uh, dying in war. There was a whole range. There was a whole range of everything, yeah. I mean, but when you remote viewed people going to hell, what, what did that look like? All I would see was this black, uh, blacker than black entrance. And the minute I would try to step in, I would be just blasted out of the session, uh, out of the session and, uh, and just, I mean, wind up trembling and sweating and start having nightmares yeah oh uh, you know that night oh uh, and what kind of nightmares did you have to the extent that you can share oh all kinds of uh death murder mayhem uh i would have i would have creative dreams of how to kill people all these creative methods for how to just torture them and kill them. And, and, uh, and I'd wake up in the morning, just, Oh, Oh, it was horrible. It was horrible. What about heaven? Just to to end that discussion on a happier topic. I didn't get streets of gold. I didn't get angels or anything like that. Uh, I found that, those people moved in to a life that was perfection, happiness, wonderful, everything they wanted, uh, loved ones that they had, you know, and uh, that it was absolute perfection. Yeah. All right. Let's talk some more esoteric targets because i think sometimes they sent you on some on some wild rides oh yeah as as practice as practice right well usually practice 
practice you, session. Usually, yeah. usually. Yeah. Okay, so when's the first time you started remote viewing and you kind of said there's something a little bit off about this or not, not terrestrial? <laughs> From the first day on. <laughs> they use that as practice? Huh? No. They, uh, the remote viewing the first day on, I thought, come on, this is strange. Yeah. <laughs> How about the four bases? We talked about this before, but people on the radio oh, have yeah. heard it. Oh, uh, yeah. Unknown to me, uh, Pat Price, one of the original remote viewers, had found four ET bases. Uh, he had passed those uh, sessions of his on to SRI, mm -hmm. and at one point, SRI passed them on to our unit and every now and then they would ask one of us blind blindly mm -hmm. yeah, to uh, view one of those targets uh, through the process of the years they sort of kept track on what was going on at these uh, at these four units and so um right because they couldn't confirm this with actual they could feedback they could, would have to correlate it based on what well, yeah. normal viewers uh, your dependability rating yeah uh, right right and uh, there was one correlate uh correlation uh one time skip called a friend of his who worked in alaska at a um tracking station and ask uh, anything unusual going there and the guy said no this is the most boring job I've ever had if if it weren't for those um, UFOs flying around Mount Hayes we'd never have anything <laughs> where was this person where was this person stationed like Fort Rain Wainwright or uh, I have no idea I have okay. no idea Skip just right. said that he was within visual range of Mount Hayes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you remote view these four bases. What do you see? At um, Mount Hayes, I saw a, um, a sort of entry point, entry and exit point to the planet Earth. Uh, ships would come in land and it was sort of like an airport mm -hmm. and uh people would go on and off ships would come in leave and all that uh, and it was uh, like a airport terminal mm -hmm. now at uh, mount zeal in alaska, in alaska australia, australia yeah right Oh, Mount Zeal in Australia. And Mount Hayes is in Alaska. That's it. Yeah. Mount Zeal yeah. was, Mount Zeal was the uh, entry point. The okay, so that's where the, that's the yeah. aircraft or uh, aircraft. But Mount Hayes up in Alaska, I found tons of equipment, but that at the point where I viewed it at the point in time where I viewed it, it was basically self-operating and abandoned. There was nobody there. Now, mm -hmm. when Joe viewed it, he found uh, not only aliens, but also uh, military, human militaries. So this is this is Joe McMonagall? Yeah. Who, okay. And uh, other viewers along the way. The uh, one in Tanganyika, I found that it was Zimbab a Zimbabwe, Africa. Uh, Zimbabwe, yeah. Uh, ignore the one in Tanba, Tanganyika. Uh, ignore that. Um, uh, I, <laughs> I don't want to ask you. I won't. I won't. I'll, I, won't you, I, won't I won't push. I won't we push. did not talk about that, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the one in Zimbabwe um, had turned into a repair station. Uh, I did not get tasked with the one 
at um, up in Spain, uh, which was the know. fourth one that Pat Price had done. I, yeah, I never got tasked for that. Perdido, right? Uh, yeah. Perdido, yeah. Now, did you ever have any interaction? I've never asked you this question, but um, he might be. It might have been after your time with Luis Salazando. No, I didn't. Time in his career. No. Okay. And then, did you ever? And I, I, I don't think you would know this guy either. This um, Dr. Michael Moran. He's a director at DARPA. No. Uh oh. No. And then, do you have any connections, or have you ever taught at the Monroe Institute? Um, I knew Bob uh, Monroe, and um, General Stobbine sent me to the Monroe Institute before he would take me into the unit. Uh, basically, I think he wanted to see if I could have an out-of-body experience, which I didn't believe in. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I did. Uh, so <laughs> made it suddenly hard to not believe in it. Uh, but uh, anyway, I guess I passed his test. So I wound up in the unit. Yeah. How long did it take you to learn how to do that? The, the OBE, the out-of-body stuff? Uh, I was there for four days, I think. And uh, I think it happened on the third day, uh, totally unexpected to me, mm -hmm. because I flat didn't believe it. I, I thought it was kind of stupid for me to be there. But uh, if the general says you're going to be there, it's you're going to be there. <laughs> yeah. It's stupid not to do what the general says That's right. when the general says it. Yeah, the general said, would you like to be in this unit? What are you going to say? No. <laughs> yeah, I would love to, General. I would absolutely love to. Okay. Now, on more kind of moving on to more contemporary events, yeah. disclosure. Have you done any work or looked at various scenarios either through remote viewing or kind of in your um, professional work about what that timeline might look like yeah can you talk about it <laughs> <laughs> i was given a talk one time and uh, they said give me a date or when contact will be made. And I said, I think around, I don't know, July 20th or, or July, the, July the 5th, somewhere around there, you know. And they said, what year? <laughs> and I said, uh, I think about 1974. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. When, it's, when did, it's already. When, it's already. When, when did that? Uh, when did they ask you that question? Roughly what year? What time period? Oh, that was after I got out of service. It was, uh, I guess, around ninety-five or ninety-six. Yeah. Uh, but, um, oh yeah, contacts already been made. And, uh, and how do they define contact, though? In, right, because somebody well, who's steeped in all this con might official contact. Official. Okay, official so that doesn't rule yeah. out that doesn't rule out a Roswell or or something like that. Oh, uh, no, it includes Roswell. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so so is this kind of the Roswell thing would have happened in nineteen forty seven? Do you mean nineteen forty seven or nineteen forty seven? 47 i'm sorry oh, okay. yeah 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 yeah. Ju no. yeah july yeah july 1947 yeah. is is exactly when i'm getting Roswell old happened. yeah <laughs> that's, that's what i'm here i'm here just to keep you just to keep yeah. you straight Len, just to keep you okay all right so you saw that point but did you see anything beyond that when kind of an official disclosure for the kind of the broad um the rest of humanity might look like 
Well, yeah, uh, that it will happen very slowly. Uh, it will happen gradually, and we will be prepared for it when it does. Uh, now, you know, such as, you know why they call them uh, UAPs now, don't you? Because they're probably not all UFO. Because, I mean, it's, it's, it means unidentified anomalous phenomena. They right? call so them UAPs so they won't have to apologize to lying about us, uh, to us, about UFOs. <laughs> Do they really think we're that stupid, Lynn? Yeah. <laughs> I knew the I knew what your answer would be. But I, and, I and at some point, they're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we go, oh, UAPs, yeah, that's good. The government, yeah, they're never going to apologize to lying to us. And do you have a sense of when we might, and you said it's gradual, but yeah. at what point are they going to say, I mean, do we have agreements? Do we have, or, you know, based on your experience, you might not know the answer to that, but. Well, yeah, you know, the UFO bases, uh, many of them uh, are located in places where kind of like Indian reservations, you know, where the government is, has said, yeah, make your base here, and we won't bother you if you don't bother us. And so uh, many of the UFO bases on Earth uh, are by agreement with governments. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do, you, do you get a sense that we're communicating with multiple civilizations or just one primary civilization? Oh, no. There's... Them and them and them and them and them and them and them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Has there been any, to your knowledge, or any of the remote viewing that you've done, any evidence of genetic manipulation? The different. Um, I have, I have no idea on that. Uh, I have, I have never been tasked with that. So. And then, in terms of other other things kind of other species that when do you think or through some of your projects have you potentially learned when kind of those relationships might be revealed to the general public uh gradually over the years yeah um they they will be leaked they will be discovered i mean you know they're discovering uh, uh videos that have been taken on ships uh suddenly finding those in the archives hey they knew about that the day it happened come on <laughs> his military intelligence they knew about it yeah are they going to do it in a way such that it's not hopelessly mixed with disinformation and misinformation? Because that tends to be what, what the case is now. There's some stuff that's real. There's a lot, and there's a ton of stuff that's just. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, P.T. Barnum, man. <laughs> you know, uh, I think P.T. Barnum said, never, never let a good disaster go to waste. And, uh, and, you know, it was always just pulling the flim flam over. And, yeah, it will always uh, have a use for disinformation, for, uh, for good information, and for using both good and bad information to control the population yeah it's that's government you no. governments do that yeah and also just hiding i don't know what is wrong system. with this computer i'm sorry are you hearing the bleep every now and then no i don't hear the bleep. Oh, you're not. There's, that's there's some good. static there's some static on your end but okay oh yeah i hear i'm hearing that now i'm hearing like electricity kind of 
That's KGB. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Ignore FSB, yeah. SVR, K, <laughs> FSB, they're, they're all, they're all, uh, yeah. yeah, they're all, they're all changed now. No, yeah, like, no, you know, get in the same, same face on a different, different front. But okay, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's depressing. Oh, yeah. I know you don't. I know you don't like to talk about it because I, I, I mean, you know where I'm going, right? So you did. Well, government's going to be government. Period. Yeah. Now you did a remote viewing project for a technology company, late nineties, early two thousands, about kind of the twenty twenty to twenty forty time period. This is what I'm talking. I know you don't like to talk about it, so I'm going to be quick about it. I won't say who that was for, but yeah. And what did you see when you did that? And this starts in twenty twenty, so no, we lived through um, three three years of it. So it was in nineteen ninety. Eight that I did that. One of the first things I saw was that um, around 2020, there would be a um, um, major thing that would happen that would um, start um, people isolating from each other. Uh, would start people having relationships through technology that would uh, start closing cities down, schools down, and things like that. Uh, um, and I saw through future years, actually the first thing that I saw was that in 2012, late 2012, there was going to be a tipping point mm -hmm. that before that tipping point we could save the ecology we could save humanity and all that but after that tipping point things were going to start going downhill and uh, i had no idea about the mayan calendar or all of that right but um, you said like the bakun bakun cycles and yeah and everybody was predicting dire death and all that. All I saw was that it was a tipping point. That before that, we could do something. After that, too late. Yeah. Was there a discrete event that was this tipping point? Uh, no, it was just the accumulation of the neglect that we've done. And that... Uh, the further after 2012, the faster downhill it would be going. Um, and that people would try to do something about it. And there would be temporary and repeated successes. But that overall, it was downhill, you know. Um, and um, I saw that. I saw a lot of things. I have published the unclassified material, uh, but I haven't published any of the classified things I found. And um, that by the year about 2040, mm -hmm. it would be so that an estimated 75% of the human population would be wiped out. Uh, but then, you know, a lot of people are predicting that, and a lot of good, dependable people are predicting that. I went further, and uh, what I got was that by about 2016, the result of that endpoint of 2040, we will have... Uh, risen up against the evils of government, the evils of uh, monopolies and everything else. Yeah, imagine the, imagine trying to tax your people after three quarters of them oh, are yeah, gone. Yeah. Good luck with that. But that even after that, we will have learned to live separately. Uh, 
the remaining population will be more agrarian, raising their own food. Uh, one of the things I got was that through technology, they would be making their own uh, tools and materials. Uh, yeah, we got at, that now, 3D printing. If well, you, and, you know. yeah, in 1998, we didn't have 3D printers, so I didn't know, you know. Uh, but um, that by the year about 2060, the survivors would have a beautiful life. Uh, the trick is being a survivor. <laughs> Did you get a sense for what precipitate is this just i know stefan schwartz did a similar exercise came to yeah he did similar conclusion but i think his thesis is it's more directly tied to climate change oh uh, it is yeah i didn't find out about that until last year and i got a report of what he had found and they parallel now, did you see anything else that was not related to climate change that may have contributed to this time of troubles in the next 17 years? Uh, yeah, I didn't focus that much on climate change in my session. Um, mainly what I found was the um, effects of people. Um, the, the results of human activity, of governmental activity, of, um, you know, corruption, but also uh, the saving of religion, by religion. Uh, also, that the um, training of mental skills was going to be the one of the things that saves the population. Uh, right now, people are asleep. They really are. And uh, that uh, at some point, there will be a, a sort of mental renaissance that will wind up saving uh, the population yeah and what would your recommendation be based on what you saw both unclassified and classified and somebody asked me you know uh will there be survivors and i said if you want there to be survivors be one you know work toward it uh Turn off your TV, <laughs> you know, uh, the propaganda machine, and uh, uh, start training your mind. And it doesn't have to be remote viewing. Uh, educate yourself. You know? Now, I think one thing you distinctly, well, I'll let you answer it. Did you see any of this caused by nuclear war? I didn't see nuclear war, and I still don't. Uh, uh, what I did see was that uh, tanks, rifles, weapons, uh, missiles would be just old timey. Uh, that. Uh, Nations would learn how to use nature and that there would be man-made natural disasters. And come to find out, the Russians have developed earthquake weapons. We have developed weather weapons. Different countries have different, you know, have developed things, things like this. Um, um, a few years ago, 
there was a um, an interview on Russian TV. Uh, to keep my Russian abilities up, I watched Russian TV. And um, there was this <laughs> uh, intel officer who was being interviewed. He was drunk as a skunk. I mean, drunk. And he started rattling off about the earthquake weapon. And he was bragging, saying that um, they had used the earthquake weapon on Fukushima as a test to see if it would work. And, uh, you know, they use it on uh, the Canary Islands. The east coast of the United States is toast. It'll be wiped out. They use it on uh, on Yellowstone National. And these Park. these are hypotheticals. These are hypotheticals, is not exactly. These are so. hypotheticals, but they're real. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If they were to use it on Yellowstone National Park, the center of the United yeah. States, gone. Uh, you know, such as that. Uh, yeah, it will come to the point where instead of having a battlefield where you have tanks and soldiers fighting each other, uh, a government or a military can just wipe out an area of the earth using nature to do it. Yeah. Did you see cyber as a component of some of this madness? I saw that um, I didn't I didn't identify it as cyber or AI or anything like that. But I saw that uh, it would come to where uh, people, instead of dealing with each other person to person, would wind up, um, uh, depending on technology, and that uh, the, re the remnant of the people would be spread out, would still stay separate from each other, and yet their technology would have advanced to the point where they would need to. Is there a reason for that? In other words, was there some sort of another pandemic where they're not talking? Oh, there's going to be just... there's going to be more pandemics. Yeah. Did you see anything related to so Ed Reardon? I don't know if you're familiar with Ed Reardon, the, or another remote yeah. viewer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you probably know all about. Um, he saw the pandemic. He also saw some of the uh, amyloids and in, in the, the clots and the blood clotting and things like yeah. that. Did, did you see any of this would be kind of related to not only pandemics but also the the cures? <laughs> Let's just leave it at. I'm, I'm deliberately using non, you know, very indirect words. Yeah. But I think you know what I'm talking about. Did you see any? Um, like a long tail of deaths associated with that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not going to say more. You can you can look in the. Mm -hmm. you know, in the in well, the and a lot of uh, crop failures, uh, starvation, uh, things like that. Um, I saw that there was also natural disasters, not man-made. I had no idea about the Grand Solar Minimum, uh, which is which is already starting, by the way. Say more about the Grand Solar Minimum. What does that mean? Uh, that the mean? Grand Solar Minimum is where the um, um, sun goes quiet. And as a process, the magnetosphere uh, uh, shrinks, more radiation can come in. Also, that the oh, so, uh, so it's our magnetosphere that our magnetosphere, reach minimum, yeah, would reach a minimum, okay, and yes, also so right. the um, the forces that keep the magnet magnetosphere okay, um, in place. As it weakens, the polar shifts, the magnetic polar shifts will start. 
and that's that's happened. Uh, I think the that North happens. Pole is down in Russia now. Yeah, I, I think that happens if you look at iron filaments in the oceans where the tectonic plates spread. There's yeah. usually a magnetic field shift or reversal every ten thousand yeah. years. Which yeah. now that I think about it, you think about the, um, you know, the younger Dryas event and and things like that. Maybe it's yeah. kind of. And okay, so so not only are you seeing human or man-made natural disasters, but you're also seeing other sorts of natural. Do you see any comets, asteroids, meteorites, like impacts and things I like that? I didn't at the okay. time. Uh, I still don't. Uh, so. And then any concentration on any particular part of the globe where this decline is or is it just no i was tasked with the future of the u.s what i got in the uh session was that it was going to be worldwide yeah. okay um I, i'm going to ask you this you don't have to answer it's, it's it's super touchy for some reason uh did you did you ever meet tim taylor at no. uh and our the national reconnaissance office or space force or anything no. like that no um, Okay. All right. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna push that line of thought any further. You know, there's, 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 there's an, an intelligence figure that um, there have been podcasts that have, you know, whenever, whenever somebody interviews Chris Bledsoe and he says this guy's name, okay, people get really, really touchy. So anyway, I'm yeah. not gonna, I'm not gonna push further. I mean, it's out there. It's been out there for a while, but um, okay. And then in terms of the disclosure anything related to disclosure during that period that might make things spicy right um you know in that session i never got anything about et's um however uh, well and that's in spite of the fact that i before i went to the remote viewing unit that's all I want to say about that. Um, I was doing some black projects uh, where there was ET involved, but let me just stop at that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to push. Good. Uh, but that's a good segue, though, because you did have, and you've talked about this publicly, so I think it's completely safe there was a break a 12-year break between when you were working on missiles in the army and i think you worked on nike systems yeah like nike missiles mm -hmm. yeah you left and became a minister i think it was like a 12-year period and went to and, college and all that yeah. yeah and you were either at home or, or traveling somewhere in east texas if i can remember correctly and something happened oh i think he meant um i was traveling from tucson to phoenix one day which is uh, about an hour 45 minute drive somewhere around there mm -hmm. and um, i stopped for a cup of coffee in tucson drove out of the parking lot and Five minutes later, drove into Phoenix. Oh, you never told the me this story, Lynn. The coffee was still boiling hot, too hot to drink. And I checked the time. It was about five or ten minutes. Uh, so I have thought and thought and thought and thought for an explanation. And... Um, a comment that Ingo made to me one time sort of solidified it. Um, in learning CRV, you learn that everything they taught you about time is absolutely wrong uh, mm -hmm. in school. And I was telling Ingo, you know, uh, I think I finally understand time. And he kind of smiled puffed on his cigar and said, 
Wait till you learn about space. <laughs> what oh. do you think happened? What happened? I have no idea. I really don't. Never have figured it out. Hmm. All right. Well, going going to the other event that I was going to get into, where you uh, this is this is this is this is the this is when you were offered a job. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? I had an abduction experience. Now, this was years and years before. Uh, I was in the ministry in East Texas uh, as a Methodist minister, and they moved their preachers uh, mm -hmm. from one church to another all the time. And uh, we were in the process of moving. My family had already moved to the new parsonage, and I was cleaning up the old parsonage. I had thrown everything into the U-Haul, uh, and I was tired. It was at night. So I made a pallet down on the floor and laid down. I was wide awake, and I heard something land in the backyard. Now, the parsonage of that place was over a quarter mile off the road. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that something would land in the backyard was strange. I tried to get up to go see what it was and couldn't move. I was frozen, but I was wide awake. Uh, and, roughly how, how old were you at this time? Oh, uh, late 20s. No, late. Early, mid-30s, I guess. Mid-30s, I guess. Somewhere around there. Uh, and um, I heard somebody coming through the grass around the house. Mm -hmm. And when I woke up, it was morning. I was standing at the back door looking out into the backyard. Couldn't figure out why turned around through the pallet into the U-Haul and drove off, feeling like I had forgotten something. Uh, can you talk for a minute? There's somebody at the door. I'll be right back. I have to I'll be right yeah, back. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sorry. All right. So I'll take a little, a brief brief break and i think that's a good time to remind folks that you are watching through a glass dark or listening to through a glass darkly radio with sean patrick hazlett i'm interviewing lynn buchanan and it is you're listening to it on united public radio so uh thank you again and let's uh before lynn comes back what other questions do folks folks have let's see All right, so Soul Light US expat is well, oh Soul Light, I got it. Can he ask about people he's seen with special abilities, like I think creating their own power and how it is possible, and is there a way to learn to do that or other abilities? Yeah, we can go into some of that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not even gonna say that word. <laughs> I'll just put it up there. Yeah, I, I mean, he didn't say specifically. It's probably just related to climate and everything else that's kind of going on in the world and i mean if you'll recall roughly around uh 2014 is when the russia ukraine business started but yes he did so the question is uh, wow did he remote view after the abduction uh so yes he did actually because he wasn't sure that it happened so he you know, I don't think he, I don't know if he did it on his own, but he gave the target to his colleagues in the remote viewing unit and they reported it without him telling them what happened. So yes, he did. So he had, he had it remote viewed. Okay. Oh, wow. It's a little spicy. Uh, so Solite, you're in Panju. He lived about six miles from the DMZ. Yeah, they uh, North Koreans can range all of Seoul, so it's you know it's a little if that war broke out, it would be 
ugly. Yeah, Lynn Buchanan is is the best. I wouldn't say he never saw that, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say the the words, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if he saw specifically that, but he saw, and, and he's not. Uh, he, well, I'm not. He, he's not gonna. It, it's in these sorts of situations. It's never, never quiet. In, in different ways but i you know unrest is probably to be expected in, in a, you know when you have fewer resources uh you know anywhere in the world uh is there anything with remote viewing related to the beings people communicate when on dmt i i haven't asked him that question but i ever have asked uh morehouse and i think the answer was kind of it's a, kind of a completely different thing Ah, yeah, I I know some Korean, but um, yeah, I don't I don't know what would happen. Well, you know, well, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna because if somebody who speaks Korean heard me say it, I it might get in trouble. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Here we go. Looks like Lynn's back. Let me. No, uh, I do not want my driveway repaved. There we go. Yeah. Ah, oh, so I someone did. was trying to get you to. Uh, Somebody's no, trying I to. I have to, I have company coming in tonight. I thought that's who it was, but. Oh, just somebody yeah. selling you something. I don't want my driveway to be paved. Someone who's snake. Actually, I, just really quick. I don't want to get spend too much time on it. But speaking of building improvements and things like that, how's the remote view ranch coming? I uh, think man. Uh, the ranch is coming along fine. We've gotten new funding. Uh, we've gotten the road fixed to where we can uh, uh, get people in and out. And uh, uh, we've gotten the RV hookups so that people can bring RVs in. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also gotten uh, uh, some construction started so uh we're we're working on it it's coming along yeah all right and then have you taught any courses yet in the remote viewing ranch i'm or? teaching online yeah I'm teaching online yeah. yeah okay and then where can they where can folks find those courses uh c r v i e w e r c r viewer dot com down at the bottom of the open page, uh, there are links to pre-sign-up videos that will tell you about the course mm -hmm. to let you know what you're getting into before you put down any money. <laughs> right. I, I believe in that. I'm firm believer in that. Yeah. And do you have kind of beginner intermediate and advanced classes do you have like a, a I do. wide variety i do okay now uh i have the base courses uh on my, you know uh the sign up for it now when you finish the base course then i give you the link to the intermediate and then to the advanced and then, all right, so go, going back into the, the general interview, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and this is, this is like the typical skeptic question that people will ask about remote viewing. And I, and I know you have a story about it, so it's not going to be a cold question. Right. All right, so if remote viewing is so great, why, is it, why, aren't, why isn't everybody correctly winning the lottery? Uh, because... Numbers, especially, are extremely hard to remote view uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can remote view them very easily. Getting the correct numbers, that's hard. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but it's that way for natural psychics, too. And mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, 
you know, the lottery. Uh, uh, you know, if you want to make money with the associative with you and all, I'd say bet on races. Mm-hmm. Bet on races. It's easier than the numbers. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could also, I mean, I'm going to go into way too much depth for a general audience, but you can do something in investing called pair trading. And pair oh, yeah. trading is where you you have two stocks, you buy one stock, and usually the stocks are related, right? So one might be Budweiser or Anheuser-Busch, the other, Bush, the other one might be Coors Light, I'm just, or Coors, yeah. right? Molson Coors. And you buy one stock and then you short the other one. And that way you can profit off of the the, the difference in performance. I so hate, if you, I hate the stock market because <laughs> it's so linguistically garbage uh, that nobody can understand it. Well, except the people making the money. That's why they do it. It's to prevent everybody from making the money. Making the money. Yeah. Huh? Right. But somebody right. else gets into it, even with remote viewing. There's so many gimmicks and so many ins and outs and everything else that knowing what a stock's going to do basically does you no good. Um, um, you can make more with the options by not buying stocks than you can by buying stocks. Um, and like you say, there's whatever the words you were talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, pair trades, pair trades. Oh, okay. you, know, you pair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now I know you did this once though with the lottery, right? There was oh, yeah. like there was. You got to tell that story because this is a good. This is a good. Yeah. Illustration I was, of that. Um, I was at the. the it, it, there's something. There's something weird about your audio your your volume so if you got sure what's wrong this got to be the most best of interview you've had in a long time uh, no it's it's it, it is pure gold it's just that people are gonna i'm gonna get a billion complaints about like what's that static oh, i mean yeah. it's better than I, my most watched my most watched interview the the <laughs> host said uh i'm very it's, it's, it, difficulties <laughs> they um, probably Somebody probably doesn't want us to talk, um, <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, it, the last time I think there was another interview where like they just cut me off. Remember? I mean, it was pre-recorded, so it was fine. But yeah, huh? yeah, where I just it just like you just lost me, right? Oh yeah, so, uh-huh. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, um, I was up at the defense intelligence agency. Mm-hmm. I had a full day of work there, and there was nothing happening. And I was sitting around. There was a forty million dollar lock lottery that day, and I thought, "I've got the time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try it." And so uh, it was six digit, six six number lottery, pick six. And so I worked all day on it, uh, honing it down, pulling it down. Got all of the numbers, and I was in Washington D.C. I lived in Maryland, and mm-hmm. so on the way. Repeat home, that. Repeat that becomes because that becomes important. You were living oh, where? I was working in D.C. I lived in Maryland. Okay, so working in D.C. Way, lived in Maryland. Okay. And so, on the way home, I bought a lottery ticket with those six numbers. The next morning, I read the newspaper, and I had gotten all six numbers correct for the D.C. lottery. I bought my ticket in Maryland for the Maryland lottery. <laughs> you can't yeah, that's win. about as useful as a football bat, right? <laughs> yeah. So what, what do you make of that? What do you make of that? That is there some trickster oh, element to this? Like like some subconscious that, element? 
It was that little Baptist kid inside saying, you have more. You're going to hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so your subconscious is basically oh, sabotaged yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right, so I think we have about nine minutes left, so I want to give you sorry, a chance to... Delay and interruption and all that. I'm sorry. Lynn, I'm telling you, it, it, the whole everything was gold. Trust me, people okay. people will will love love some of the I stuff that's so. yeah that's that's come out. Okay, so what what do you make of the, kind of the abilities that you kind of have? Because a lot of this 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 stuff appeared, the movie, the men who stared at goats. One of the the George Clooney character was based on yeah. like three people, and you were one of them. Yeah, what do you make of that? portrayal if you want to call it that oh it was funny uh, he made that whole movie made absolute fun just ridicule of everything we did in the unit i thought it was hilarious many of the other guys in the unit got mad over it um they did part of the filming out here at white sands just a few miles from me they wouldn't mm -hmm. let me onto the set. Yeah, because they knew it was a hit job. They didn't want you. Yeah, you know. they, they knew that it was a hack job. Yeah. Right. So um, I could have told them a whole lot funnier stuff, you know, more ridiculous stuff that happened. You, you have you have any any stories that you you might be able to share in these last few minutes about some of the? Oh, not that I can think of right off. But yeah, we did some. We did some really. Funny stuff. We would we would carry stuff in the field and have have uh, viewers in the unit go out with dowsing rods trying to find what was buried in the field. You know, we wandering around the field. <laughs> Tell me, you didn't send people to like heavily populated areas to do that because that sounds like something. Uh, a good no, prank. Uh, no. <laughs> no, and. Okay. Uh, you know, we uh, uh, we were we were housed in condemned buildings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, these they, are kind of the buildings that were built in like World War Two, like post World oh, War Two sort of. We were the yeah. bastard children of the intelligence community. Nobody wanted to admit we existed. Um, um, we were looked at with suspicion and fear uh, because yeah, it was there was demonic no you know there were no secrets at all yeah. um, and so a lot of people in the government were actually scared of us because they want their secrets mm -hmm. do you think the government's still doing this i'll give you my standard answer okay I hope so, yeah, of course. Yeah. Because um, it would be stupid for them not to. So that there's the company, I think. So that changes the question to: Does the government ever do anything stupid? <laughs> no. Is that a trick question, uh, Lynn? <laughs> but the fact is, you know, when you retire, they mm -hmm. tell you things. So, uh, I have my opinions to the answer to that, but I have no proof either. Yeah, there was an interview that was on Project Unity yesterday with a DARPA official. His name was Dr. Michael Moran, and yeah. he he claimed that they were still, still you know, still doing it. Uh, there are, which is not there are many indicators that they are. And then, I mean, I, I imagine they're also contracting and stuff like that, but, oh, yeah. you know, I'm not. Okay. Now, there was something I think you told me in the past, going back to the men who stared at goats. There was actually one of your, or someone you may have known who actually was able to, you know, kill, kill one of these animals by doing that. And then uh, kind of had. There was somebody who did the. That actually happened. That actually yeah, happened. yeah. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know him 
personally. But he, I think you, he, he struggled with it though, right? There was something weird, like oh, something. Yeah. Uh, I heard that um, it affected him so badly that he went to wall. A wall. Oh, he went a wall. I didn't know that. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. And in the movie, it shows him getting into a helicopter and disappearing. And uh, that's what I heard that he. I heard that he stole a helicopter and went a wall. And that do you know how to fly one? <laughs> you yeah. steal. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we have about three minutes left. So, anything you want to tell the audience about remote viewing and any other general advice about the nature of reality? The uh, nature of reality sounds pretty simple. Straightforward. Yeah, you know, it's about. a neat thing you'll ever learn. learn. Uh, it, it teaches you how to get in touch with your own subconscious mind. And the thing is, that changes your life for the better. Um, um, they say you are who you are in the dark, and that uh, you, the the whole thing in life is to become friends with yourself. Once you learn mm -hmm. how to work with your own inner self, uh, you talk about change in your life. Um, I know Professor Park says that the remote viewing is in and uh, gaining information and all that is just like 1% of the benefits. Mm -hmm. And the, I believe that that's true. Yeah. When you remote viewed people, have you ever had the sense that they could see you or, or perceive you when you were doing it? Only, only certain in, in each, yeah. But uh, and this was, I think this was Mount Hayes, right? Where they just kind of noticed you and they said, you'll finally Mount take Zio. a look. Mount Zio. Mount Zio. Oh, in Mount yeah. Zio. Okay. Did you get a chance uh, to see what they looked like? Kind of what the entities looked like? Oh, yeah. yeah. What do they look like? Were they grays? Uh, gray. Yeah. Now, in Mount Zeal, there were uh, humans. There were military humans. Uh, there were ETs of different types. Uh, I was the only one I've ever heard of. Um, there was a an ET there with the ET child, a gray child, and uh, they were waiting for the ship to come. Um, and I think that's the only report I've ever heard of an E.T. child, a gray child. How, so you're saying like a child, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And did you get any perception of what that meant or what what it was like? Uh, there might be families. I mean, I don't. I know there are eight, I know there are these women, you know, but um, I didn't know there were families of any kind. Um, All right. Well, Lynn, I think we're at the the end of the hour, so uh, I appreciate you. Oh. That's it. I think. I think. I think it's. I think we'll be good. I think people will good. appreciate the perspective, and it's always good to see you, my friend. It's always good, good to see you. you. Good talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. Sometime. In, sometime. In, sometime in person. At some okay. Point. You know that I can do metal. Can you know, PK, right? Yeah. If you're up right this way, and you don't stop the visit, you're in trouble. <laughs> All right. I just drove through your state over the summer, so oh, I should have. Yeah, but, you should have stopped. Yeah. Yeah, I should have stopped. Coffee's hot. 
the mat welcome mats right side up. Stop. Yeah. All right, my friend. It's always Good it's always you. fun talking to you. All right. You have a great uh you know, great rest of the the, the day and uh we'll we'll definitely we'll definitely talk soon. I think I'm gonna go throw this computer in the trash. <laughs> That's very calmly I'm just glad you didn't get angry enough for it to just fizzle out. Yeah. But uh all right, my Thank friend. You very much. All right. Thanks. Talk soon. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Thanks, everyone. And uh, see you next week. Uh, Terry Loveless is coming back. Uh, he, you know, yeah. hopefully the scheduling stuff is is all good. But uh, y'all have a have a great night. Talk soon. Thank you, John.